left off. I turn that myself. Momentum. Okay, Paul just got done. He was thanking the Thessalonians. You remember for for just receiving the word as it actually was. They accepted it. They received it um, as it was the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. He took, let them know about suffering. He let them know those Thessalonians were being persecuted a lot. And if you've ever been like criticized or persecuted by religious people, you know what can tend to happen. You tend to think. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, the Jews were really persecuting these new believers at the time. And so Paul just said, hey, no, they're, they displease God. They're hostile to all men, and they're keeping up their sins to the limit. And they don't, they're, they're stopping men from getting saved. And so um, that's kind of where they left off. If you remember in chapter 2, they were accusing Paul of all sorts of things, and blah, blah, blah. So I was kind of at a weird spot right here. We're, we're at verse 17. Okay? So I'm just going to read it through. And uh, I, I wanted to do chapter 3 um, as well, but the Lord just said, I felt like he was just saying, I want you just to do this short little bit. So we're going to read the last part, and this is super important um, if you're a Bible-believing Christian and you're ministering to other people. Starting in verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, But brothers, we were torn away from you for a short time. In person, not in thought. Out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I called it again and again. But Satan stopped us. For what is our hope? Our joy? our crown, in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Let's pray. Father, just we just ask that you would open up our minds and our hearts and our spirits to whatever you want to speak to us personally, Lord God. You know right now those who are hurting from physical, from pain, Lord, from sickness. You know those who are hurting from emotional uh, trauma, Lord, maybe this was a hard Christmas for them and, and a difficult time of year, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray for those right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that just need to be encouraged or exhorted. We pray for those right now that are being just attacked by the enemy, Lord, that you would push them back in Jesus' name. Protect them, Lord God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Heal those who need to be healed. Protect those who need to be protected. And help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. You're our hope. You're our king. You're the author and perfecter of our faith. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. Well, the first thing I would want to talk about here, and, uh, and, and I want to talk about first, is I've, I've listened to a lot of teachings and, and different branches of the church and stuff, and, and uh, I think sometimes folks have the right heart, but they don't know what the Word says sometimes. You know what I mean? I don't know if you found that out with Christians sometimes. They can be very zealous for the Lord. Do you know what I mean? But zeal without knowledge isn't good. Do you know what I'm saying? Zeal without love. Yeah. It's just not good. So we have to have, it's great to have the zeal. Some of us, some of us might have the knowledge, but not the zeal and not the heart. That's not good either, okay? But some folks uh, will come, and, and, and actually many churches have a little underlying theme of, hey, you're a king's kid. You're a child of the king. You are a daughter and son of the living God, which is all true, right? And comes with incredible benefits, doesn't it? But they, they, then they go on to say that, uh, and leave the impression that nothing can affect you, that nothing can hurt you. That nothing can stop you. That, you know, I've been in many a prayer sessions where, you know, uh, I don't even know how to say it right, so hopefully you'll hear the pump hard in it. To where somebody will be coming in and, and, and they're hurting in some way. And, and they're really damaged. And it's almost like they're almost looked down upon as like a lesser Christian, or if they're being attacked by the enemy, there's almost a stigma like, oh, you're just. 
Yeah, obviously, you don't know that you're a king's kid and you don't have to put up with this. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Am I making myself clear? Do you know what I'm saying? And so they almost leave this impression, because you're a king's kid, and because you're saved, that you don't have problems. I mean, not real. You don't have enemy attacks. You don't have things that go wrong in your life, or, or this type of things, right? They leave that impression. And, and so the Christian is, is, feels guilty. Well, maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm the weirdo that has this sickness. Maybe I'm the weirdo that has all these problems. Maybe I'm the, the, the orphan. I'm not really saved because I'm being going under this attack or I'm going through a time of depression. Do you hear what I'm saying? And that is really damaging for folks in the long run. So the first question I want to ask, now we're talking now to you, and I'm asking you a question, and here it is, is in our walks with the Lord, in when we're ministering to other people, when we're sharing God's word, when we're sharing our hearts, when we're sharing our lives, can Satan hinder us? Can he stop us? I'm asking you this question. I'm, I, really, I'm asking you. What is he answer? Okay, I see a hand up over here. Would you mind, Jaden, go bring the uh, microphone? Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm getting so tall. Um, I would say yes and no because, like, he, he can if you, like... I'm going to try to say nothing. Yeah, okay, okay. So he can't stop us, like, without the Lord's consent. Like, he can't, he doesn't have the power to do that. Okay. But, like, if we're weak in our faith and we're not, you know, constantly, like, seeking him and stuff like that, Satan can hinder us. He can, you know, slow us down, make us feel bad, make us not want to, you know go to church or uh, be kind to someone. Just He can do that, but he can't like physically stop God's plan for us as long as God, you know, he has to allow Satan to do so. Okay. I'm purposely not saying anything because so you might be right, you might be wrong. Because maybe I'm going to take your Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so, just again. Can Satan hinder our walks with the Lord? Can Satan hinder uh, what we're trying to do for God? We're ministering to others. Does anybody else want to say something? Give me a chance. Okay, one. Rebecca, do you think Satan? Do you think Satan can hinder us as as born again believers? I think. Will you raise, raise your hand on your new? He's been hindering in my life lately for a while because I was in a car accident and broke my ankle. And I've had to live in a woman's shelter, and then thank God for Connie, she's let me stay with her. And she's helped me a lot, and I'm very thankful. And that was God bringing her into my life. And if it wasn't for her, I would be out on the streets. And I'm very thankful to the Lord. I pray to Him every single night. I pray to Him before my meals. I'm just so thankful to the Lord God Almighty for what He's done for me. Amen. Good word, Amen. Good word. Now, what else? Do you think Satan can hinder us? Praise the Lord. You got one back there? We got another one back there? Yep. I want to hear from you. He said, this is a genuine question. Do you think Satan can hinder us? Yes, Many he can say if no. we give in to him and his whispers. If we give in, he can hinder us. Okay. Good. What else? Okay, there's one more. Uh, got one more there. One more there. Yes, he can, and he can stop us from coming to church and not want us to be here to listen to what God has to say. Okay, good. Oh, I shouldn't say good or bad. I should say nothing. Uh, we've got another one right up here. Uh, right here, too. Thanks, sweetheart. To hinder is to make slow or to difficult the progress of, to hamper or to hold back. So most of the time when my faith is the strongest, when I've been called and equipped and I know it is from the Lord, that is when the hindrances come often the most. Because Satan does not want that to be accomplished. And it is a battle. It's a battle of the mind. It's a battle of the will. It's a battle of the soul often. Um, of course, a hindrance never said it was victorious in it. It's just to make slow the progress or to redirect sometimes to keep me from what God has called me to do. Okay. We have one more over here. We'll take one more. Good. 
Thank you for sharing that, Stanley. Oh, you have one too? Uh, yeah, I believe uh, if we uh, let our minds, if we uh, don't have the faith of uh, the, the shield on, we don't have our guard up. Uh, um, yeah, we can if, if we let him. Um, as far as I know, uh, when he was booted out of heaven, he was on earth, so, um, you know, causing havoc. havoc. Yeah, causing havoc. And the uh, Lord uh, comes back, so. If we only if we let him, uh, I mean, only if we let him, I believe that he would be there. Okay, well, let's let's look at some of these things. Now, first, th those are all good comments, okay? So as we go through this, I think some of those these comments will, get, are, will be ferried it out, you know? Um, one of the things I can say, as we just read this passage, okay? Um, and we'll, get, we'll go through it uh, in, in a minute. Um, but one of these things, when I look at at 1 Thessalonians, okay, and that those few verses that we just took time to read, okay, it says, but the Thessalonian people in verse 17, they were, they were, remember, they were being told that Paul doesn't love you, doesn't care about you, doesn't spend enough time with you, why isn't he back at Thessalonica? And 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 it wasn't that he didn't want to go. He says that he, he longed to see them, he wanted to come to see them, right? But it says that Satan stopped him. He tried again and again, or hindered it. And I'm going to say, I will say one, one quick thing. I'm going to use a little wordplay here. And this is an important um, point that I want you guys to see. You see that, I don't know what your Bible says, but it says, uh, in verse 18, mine says, For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan stopped us. Do you see that in your Bible? Does anybody else have a different translation? What does it say? Yeah, what does your say? Thwarted. Thwarted. Okay, good. Anybody else? Yes. It says hindered us. Hindered. Good. What was it? Blocked our way. Blocked our way. Hindered. Good. What else? Satan blocked our way. Yep. Yep. Good. Okay. I'm going to tell you something. I I, I love my I love my NIV. I love my NIV. Um, but there are some times where other translations I think will hit a word better, and so some of those that you told me I think. Is a better translation. It says, but Satan stopped us. Now the word uh, in Greek is eg kopto. Eg kopto. And what it means, it literally means to impede by cutting off some by cutting off someone's path. Okay? So when it says Satan stopped us, it means to impede by cutting off someone's path. So could that translation be right where it says Satan stopped us? The answer is yes and no. Because Satan did stop Paul. It says right here in Scripture that he stopped him, blocked his way. And, then, and it says he tried again and again, right? But it really, a better translation, because it just means he blocked that path. So he was trying to go see them, and Satan was stopping him. He was trying again and again and again. And so he ended up, well, we'll I won't we'll spoil it for you later, but the, a better translation would probably be uh, to, means to detain, or better yet, to hinder. So, the one thing I can say, uh, can Satan stop us, even if we're faithful? I think there are times when he can, for a time being. <coughs> now, can he ultimately stop God's plan, folks? No. No. But he can certainly hinder it, the more we let him. And you can be a man of great faith. I, I don't know about you, but I think Paul seemed to have a lot of faith. Don't you think? Yeah. You think he did? Yeah. Do you know Paul uh, Paul had a lot of power, didn't he? Yeah. Do you know it says that even when, when he was working, he worked as a tent maker so that he wouldn't take a lot of money from the people. So he worked other jobs to help pay for, for this. And he would wipe his face and people would steal those handkerchiefs and grab them and people would even be healed by the power of these handkerchiefs. Right? Yep. So I think Paul had the power, didn't he? Yep. So listen, it, sometimes it's not about always, sometimes we can have all the faith in the world, <laughs> like Paul, and sometimes Satan can still get an hit us because we're human, right? Even Paul got discouraged sometimes. Did you know that? Sometimes God had to show up and, and send and, and, and tell him to take courage in some of these cities because he was very discouraged. Mm -hmm. 
Now listen, I want to tell you some things. Um, when I hear some prayers, I just I punch Satan in the mouth, I kick him in the... Yeah, anyway, and, and, and I appreciate, because we have the power uh, of the Lord on our side. And the Bible does say, I don't want to make light of this, the Bible does say this, and this is important. It says, yeah, we get that for a second, and this is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. He says, you dear children, if you are born again, you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, right? This is what he says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. You've overcome those demonic forces, those satanic forces, right? Because the one who is in you is greater than the one that is in this world. You're right. Stanley Satan does have, he's the prince of the power of the air, and he's doing a lot of damage in this world. But if you have, that's why it's so important, God said you must be born again, because you can't do this in your own power. No. The Bible says that you're to be strong. It doesn't say that. It says be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. If you think you can do it on your own, let me tell you, you're going to fall flat on your face. But if you can rely and trust in the Lord, you're going to see Him do abundantly amazing things in your life, more than you could ask or imagine. And that's the truth. Listen, the Bible says that they've overcome Him, Satan, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, by the blood of the Lamb, right? <clears throat> by Jesus and the word of the testimony. And they loved not their lives even unto death. So then the question is, how does Satan hinder us? Because this is important to know as Christians. Because sometimes knowing is half the battle. Do you know what I mean? So we're going to go through a couple ways, and this is how Satan can hinder us. This is not a complete thing. Even as I made this really pretty slide with all these things on it, I'm thinking of more. I'm throwing them on there. So this is not an exhaustive list, but this is some things that we need to think about. Here's the first thing that... Yeah, we can leave that off for a few minutes. Satan whispers lies to us and is the father of lies. Okay? That's how he can hinder us. I, I want you to take a minute. I want you just to think. What is the lie that he speaks to you? What is the lie that's holding you back from living all out for Jesus? What is the lie he's telling you that's tripping you up? What's stopping you from serving? What's stopping you from coming to the Bible study? What's stopping you the greatest, from... The greatest lie he ever said is that he doesn't exist. Say, yes, or he doesn't exist. That's a lie, right? We'll put him off. I want you to think about, he's called the father of lies. Listen. John 8, 44 says this. He was speaking to religious people, Pharisees. They had all the knowledge in the world, but they missed the heart of love. Right? The love, the joy, peace, patience, <laughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he told them, he said, Jesus said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, and there is no truth in him. Listen to this. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He is a liar, and the father's lies. So think of that lie. Can I ask you? I, I, we won't be able to get the mic to everybody this time, so I'm going to... I know I just told you to use the mic, but why don't you shout out a lie that Satan says to us? Somebody, just, just shout it out. Give me a lie. I'm not good enough. Thank God. I'm not good enough? What else? God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. Not worthy enough. Not worthy enough. You'll never make it. You'll never make it. Can't meet him. Can't meet him. What else? God's not listening. God's not listening. Good. All good. What else? What else does he like to you personally? God doesn't care. God doesn't care. Not good. Not good enough. He won't listen to me. God doesn't won't listen to me. God won't forgive me. Jesus is not God. Jesus is not God. His word is not true. Right? Oh, aren't all these things? Think of what, what is the lie that's holding you back? Think about this. The first time you ever see Satan in the Bible, okay? The first time Satan appears to us is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And the first words from his demonic lips are to cause believers to be suspicious of God's word. 
Do you remember that? And to doubt the truth? Do you remember what he said? Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It's the first thing he ever spoke was to cause people to doubt and to be suspicious of God's word. He's a liar. And he's undermining God's truth and power from the beginning. Listen to that. He'll whisper these lies to you. The second time in the Bible is in Genesis 3-4. It says Satan spoke a simple but clever lie intended to deceive the believer. He told them, I mean, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Oh, you don't need to listen to God. You'll be just fine. Now, was that true? Was it not true? Both. Both. Did they die? Physically? Physically, no. Whole lie. But spiritually, did yes. they? Yes. Separation. See what I'm saying? Satan will always tell you it's not really a big deal. Whatever that sin you're compromising on, that's holding you back, it's not really a big deal. It is. And it's killing you. Listen, Jesus said something really neat. I, I really like this in, in um, uh, the book of John. I, don't uh, I actually did teach you on this, so I forgot to put this, the address. But it says, for this purpose, Jesus was saying, I was born when he was talking to Pontius Pilate. He says, I have come into the world to testify of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what's truth? Satan's been whispering him for a long time. You don't need to believe truth. Truth is relative. You know, it's, it's relative. You don't need it. And God's saying, no, my word is truth. My church should be the pillar and foundation of truth. And yet it's compromised all the time. This is one thing that I hear a lot, for me personally, okay? And, and I, I've showed this slide once before. I can't. Satan whispers that to me all the time. I can't do it. <clears throat> Now, when that happens, that lie is whispered to me, I can't, I can't, I can't. I can very easily, my flesh even wants to take that. I don't know why. Yeah, I really can't. I say, you know what I mean? That's my flesh. But I go back to the Word, and I say, wait a minute, that's not true, because God says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he takes that can't, <laughs> bears it upon himself. Can. So if you say he doesn't love me, you look at that, but that's not what his word says. It says, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. When you feel condemned and guilty, you remember the Bible says if you're in Christ, there is some condemnation. No. No condemnation no. for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? When, when, when you have those thinking, thinking thoughts, you go back to the Word. Does that make sense? Yeah. You replace that lie with the truth of God's Word. You put off that junk in your mind. And what the world's taught you, or what your friends taught you, or what, your, what you think of you, and you replace it with the truth of God's Word. Amen? Every time. Listen. Here's another way. It says that he, he hinders us. He blinds the minds of unbelievers. We have to remember this is a spiritual battle. When you're sharing Christ, how, it, it, you need to be in prayer. It, it, it says in, in 2 Corinthians, well, I'll tell you that what it says in a second, but not only does he speak lies to us, but Satan also hides the truth from us. Satan blinds us so that we see facts and feelings in, in, instead of uh, faith. When we read the word, he blinds us to see religion instead of relationship with Jesus, which is life giving. He, he, we see proofs instead of the preciousness of his word. We see words of information and not words of transformation because he blinds us. 2 Corinthians 4 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. We need to pray when we're talking about because Satan is blinding them. He's doing this as you're trying to show them something or speak the truth to them. It also says that he masquerades in costumes of light and righteousness. 
That's what he does. He's a, he's a hypocrite. That just means an actor. He's a, he's a fake, a phony. This is how he hinders us. 1 Timothy 4.1 says that the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the faith. It's the devolution of man. We're not evolving, we're devolving. It says, and they will follow deceiving spirits and teachings that come from demons. But can I tell you? Jonathan, you have your laser pointer? Can you just put a little circle around that little demonic face right there for a second? Just do that right there. See that? They don't look like that. Here's the deal. Thank you. Good job. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15 says, And no wonder that people are going to be deceived like that, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He's not going to wear the big red jumpsuit. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. I love this. Neely drew this a long time ago. I think that was you, Neely. 99% positive. Matthew 7, 15 and 16. I don't know if you can see these, all these sheep. You notice? That, there's one there. It's a little bit. It says, Beware of false teachers who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are wolves and will tear you apart. You can detect them by the way they act, just as you can identify a truth by its fruit. Listen, there's folks in churches, it, we're all growing, right, in the Lord? At least I beg, I hope that we are. We should be, right? And when we grow, sometimes we get offended with people, sometimes we, we say dumb things, sometimes we, you know what I mean? Because we're learning, we're growing, we have this, okay? But sometimes the enemy puts little plants in there to purposely lead people astray and to hinder their faith. We have to be aware of that. We also know that Satan is a tempter and tempts you to sin. He baits the hook for you. You personally. And this is, for, this is speaking to Christians in 2 Corinthians 11.3. It says, but I, this was Paul saying, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds will somehow be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion of Christ. We can be led astray. So what do we do? We need to be watchful. We need to be really looking out. Because it's in that little show that you're watching. That you've been convicted about. That you're still watching. Or what you're reading. Or what you're looking at. You know what I'm talking about. What you're doing. He says be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, roars around, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In 1 Peter 5.8. <laughs> be watchful <laughs> because he's right behind you waiting crouching seeking whom he may devour be watchful be in the word and be with others can I tell you something I was talking to a, a brother and sister their kids in, uh, anyway, they're sick today I would say that so um, and, and I called just to encourage and it, I got the Uno reverse card and they ended up spending like a half hour on the phone encouraging me in the Word, in the Word. And, and it almost was like, wow, I need to get my act together a little bit in that area. Right? See, if you're watchful, and if you're in the Word, and you're with other Bible-believing Christians, then they're going to say, you know what? This isn't a good idea. You shouldn't be going off in that direction. Not in a judgy way, but in a good way that, because they love you. Or, hey, I don't know, God's speaking this to me. How about you? Do you know what I'm saying? And when it comes to temptation, remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 says that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. Satan always wants you to think you're the only one that's going through this. But let me tell you, God is faithful, and the Bible says he won't let you be tempted beyond what you could bear. And when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Satan also plucks the word out of people's hearts and chokes out faith, right? With the riches of life, it's like he's choking the very life out of you with other things that your heart desires. He's choking you. Uh, this is a terrible... I don't know if you've ever been... Have you ever felt like compression on your chest or have you ever been not being able to breathe? It's a scary, scary feeling. That's what the enemy's doing. 
He's choking the very life out of him. He's running after riches or pride of life or things like that. And Satan and his demonic forces are battling against us. Listen, we just read here that Paul was trying to go see these Thessalonians, right? And he couldn't. And how Satan used these circumstances, I don't know. Now listen, sometimes things just happen in life, right? The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust, right? Sometimes Christians will get rained on. Sometimes Christians, I just read uh, eight Christians this Christmas uh, were beheaded uh, by ISIS. They lined them up, shot one in the head, and then beheaded the other 11. I think I read the year two. in China? Uh, that was in Africa. And uh, I know that in the year 2000, there was at least, I, think we, I just read that there was, this is in 2000, there was 200,000 martyrs, those who believed in Jesus Christ, that were hurt or killed, or imprisoned, or beaten, or tortured. Now I'm guessing that's probably way up. But this happens. But sometimes Satan will use circumstances to hinder us. He did that to Paul. Sometimes... Um, he'll, he'll, he'll use storms in his life. When Jesus went over, you remember the story? You guys remember when he went over to the other side? It said that he was going over to the Decapolis and he got in a boat and he went over to the other side and then the furious storm came. You remember that? The winds and waves started flooding the boat. And the first thing they said, Jesus, don't you care about me? That's what happens when we get in those bad situations. First thing I think, he just doesn't love me. He really loves Laura. He really loves Scott. <laughs> It's just, he forgets me. I'm the jerk. I'm the knucklehead. Right? And they did the same thing. They said, oh, Jesus, don't you care? And he said, oh, don't you little thing. And he said, he said something really neat, if I remember correctly. He said, and he got up and he, he rebuked the wind and the waves. And he said a Greek word, I think it's demazo. I'm going from memory now, so, uh, from about a year ago. And, and, when he said, be quiet, be still, it was the same word he used when he silenced the demons. He used that same word to rebuke them and to shut them up. So to me, that's saying this little furious storm was stopping, trying to stop Jesus to get to this demonically possessed guy on the other side who he eventually freed. So sometimes, sometimes these storms in our life can be demonic. Not always. Don't think every circumstance is from the enemy or every storm is from the enemy. That's not true. But sometimes even sickness can be from the enemy. Now, please hear me now. Not every time, of course. Most of the time, we, we're all going to die of something, right? Every single one of us. It's just a matter of when. But listen, in Luke chapter 13, 16, it says that there was a woman that she was bent over in half. For 18 years, and it said specifically that Satan himself, right? That Satan himself had her bound up for those 18 years. He said, why shouldn't I free her? He healed her on the Sabbath day, set her free. And all the Pharisees could think about was their religious rules. How sad. But it says that she was bound up. Satan had her hindered. Had her... You remember Moses. You remember when he went to go free his people? Right? And, and God said, hey... I want you to throw down the staff to show them my power and it'll turn into a, a snake, right? Remember that? Before Pharaoh? Do you remember what those those ones that worship other gods, those magicians, do you remember what they did? Yeah, yeah. What did they do? Yeah, yeah. Same things. That's right, they threw theirs down. It says, and of course God's ate them up, but even when they were saying, let them go in plague after plague, the first three plagues, I think, it says that by their dark arts, it says these demonic forces managed to do the same. By their dark arts, imitate what God was doing. Stopping Pharaoh from letting them go. But then finally, it got to the point where these, these magicians and these enchanters and these sorcerers said, this is the finger of God. We can't do anything about it. He's more powerful. And then eventually, you know the story, they let him go. Or even Daniel. Can I read you something real quickly in Daniel? I'm going to go and, uh, just a second, find 
I think this is in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, it says in verse 12 that uh, an angel was sent. Okay? Daniel was praying and seeking the Lord and asking for help in the spiritual warfare. I, I don't know about you, but do you remember the story of Daniel? Do you know Daniel? Is he a pretty godly guy? Yeah. Right? Wasn't he? Yeah. Powerful in the Lord, powerful in the Word, man of integrity, right? Even in captivity? Listen now, hear me. It says this, this messenger of the Lord came and, and, and touched him and it says, Daniel, you are who are highly esteemed. Hey, that says a lot. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I've been sent to you. And we, when he said this to me, Daniel said, I stood up trembling. And then he continued, he said, Fear not, or do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your heart to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. But I have come in response to them. But the prince of the power of the air, the prince of the Persian kingdom, resisted me 21 days. And he goes on to say, Then Michael, one of the chief uh, princes, came to me because I was detained. And now I have come to explain to you what has happened to your people in the future for the visions concerning the time yet to come. So here's Daniel, awesome godly guy, right? And he's experiencing satanic hindrances. So when that happens to you, don't get in the pit. Do you know what I'm saying? We have to remember that the Bible says this, and it's an ominous thing, but it's true. Ephesians 6.12, I got it in the New Living Translation because it just said it in a nice, fresh way. I don't know. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. That's clear, isn't it? Now, do you hear it, but do you know it? Do you know this to be true? Maybe you've kind of forgotten but can I just ask you? Please, in the name of Jesus, wake up. <coughs> wake up. I'm not saying this in a jerky way. I'm saying wake up. You, me, us. Wake up and realize we're in the middle of a battle. You're already in the battle. If you don't realize you're in a battle, how much worse is it for you? Has anybody ever gotten in a fist fight? Okay, it's not very fun. Okay. Now imagine being in a fist fight and not realizing you were in a fist fight. <laughs> you would get the snark beat out of you, would you not? Because when you get hit, you have to, you know, you dodge, you, you roll with the punches. I mean, it's... if you play sports, right? A quarterback. I remember. Now, okay, this will show my age, okay. and it will show my. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. Oh, get out of here! Okay, so there's two of us. Be brave. I am Ella. Okay, good. Now it's three of us. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm a Chicago Bears fan. Some of you, I know they won't. But remember Jim McMahon, yes. quarterback? Okay, so if, if you were from Chicago, you'd know that 1985 was like our only good, really. Yeah. And so I remember this one time, you know, Jim McMahon. This guy was a tough guy. He would go in there and <laughs> scrap with the best of them, right? This quarterback, he wasn't like a big on. Anyway, Jim McMahon was walking back to the sidelines one time, and this lineman was mad, and he didn't see him coming. This was after the, the whistle had blown, and the guy picked him up the back and threw him down, crumpled him. Totally destroyed this tough, tough quarterback. Because he didn't realize that the battle was still going on. That's what happens to us if we're not paying attention. Right, Ezekiel? <laughs> Listen, guys. So what do, we, what do we do? The first thing is, how do we combat all these hindrances and, and attacks of Satan? First, the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now, it doesn't say when or how, <laughs> But the first thing to do before you do this is this. Everybody forgets this part. Submit yourselves to God. 
Picture this, Chantel. Picture this. You're just on your knee and you're giving up whatever it is you're holding on to. Is it unforgiveness? Is it bitterness? Is it hurt? Is it unbelief? Submit yourself to God. What area of your life are you not bending the knee to Him? I don't know what it is. I don't. But at first, before you can resist the devil, it says specifically, submit yourself to God. You have to put yourself under the power of the Word. Or you will not get the power that you need to resist. So first, submit yourself to God. Then you resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Then draw near to God. And draw, and I would say, draw near to God and his promises. He will draw near to you. Give me a few more minutes. I saw a few hands up. Guys, I'm just going to ask you to wait for a few minutes. And remember what God's Word says. I might feel like a failure right now. I can't handle it right now. And those feelings are very real, right? In our hearts, we feel them. Maybe you have too. But replace that with what God says. He says, in all things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. I know a conqueror is somebody who wins, but being more than conquerors, is knowing that you've already won the battle. Let's get this one. So what do you do when your ministry is hindered? And listen, your ministry, for some of you, that might just be getting to church. That might just be honoring him in some way. That might just be getting to the Bible study. You know what I'm saying? Or it could be maybe you're trying to talk to somebody about the Lord and they're not listening. They're not hearing what you have to say. Do you know what I mean? What do you do when your ministry is hindered? And here's a couple things. The first thing you do is you pray and ask God for discernment. Listen, Paul was given discernment to know the difference between normal circumstances of life and a satanic attack. I just In verse 18, we read... In Thessalonians here, and I circled it, it says, but Satan stopped us, right? Or Satan hindered us. I like that better. In verse 18. So when you run into these situations, pray and ask, why am I getting so much opposition? Is it just a fluke? Is it just a circumstance that's happening in my life? Or is this, is this the enemy that's working against me? Pray, ask him for discernment so that you can know the difference supernaturally. What is it, God? When you're being hindered. Second is to walk in faith and not by sight. In verse 17 it says that he's kept away from the Thessalonians. It says literally, I've got it circled, for a short time. That means Paul knew that it wasn't going to be forever. Do you know what I'm saying? You're going through it right now. Some of you are going through it right now. Now in, in God's economy... It's a short time. In your economy, it seems like it's never going to end, doesn't it? But it will. Because God will give you ultimately the victory. It says it would only be a short time he knew until the roadblock was overcome. If God wanted it to happen, it'll happen in his time. Here's another thing you can do when your ministry is hindered. Fight against any demonic opposition. And I wanted to fit in here, but I couldn't. With all you got with all you've got. <clears throat> because there's something in me, and I don't know if it's in you, and if it's not in you, praise the Lord it's not in you. But there's something in me that goes when I'm beat down a lot, when I'm really tired, I take the towel, I might as well just forget it. I can't. How much beating do I need to right? No, no. Fight against any demonic opposition you have with all you got. And, and verse 18, do you remember? Look at verse, look at your Bibles. In verse 18, it's in, in 1 Thessalonians. Right? It says, and I circled this too. It says, we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan stopped us. So he kept on going. Listen, I want to get this word to these people. I want to encourage people. I want to strengthen them in the Lord. I'm not satisfied where they're at. 
I'm going to keep going until they completely reject me. I'm going to go and I'm not stopping. Don't you give up. Fight. The enemy wants to take that fight away from you. Don't let him do it. So you keep doing it no matter what. Also, I want you to think about this. 1 Thessalonians is not the first letter in the New Testament, the oldest, but it's, they think it's Paul's first letter. Okay? 1 Thessalonians. So, think about this. It was the first letter he ever wrote to the churches that we have in our Bible, right? Now, a lot of the New Testament is, is written by who? Paul. Paul, well, yes. Paul, well, the Holy Spirit, right? But, but Paul, right? So, let me ask you a question. If this was the first letter ever written to the churches, what actually prompted Paul to write this letter that you're being encouraged by 2,000 years later. What prompted Paul to write that letter? Tell me. Can you think about it? Think about it. Paul couldn't get to them. Chantel, what caused him? Now, this is the only answer I want. This is only this question specifically. Okay, but I have a question from earlier. Well, you're going to have to wait just a minute. I love you, but you're going to have to wait. Because this is important. What prompted Paul to write this letter to the Thessalonians? Because he wanted to get there, and no matter what he did, he couldn't seem to make it. So he was being hindered by something, and he needed to know what it was, so he asked God what it was. You're so very close. You're right on. Here's the here's deal. Yes, you're raising your hand. Go ahead. Experience? Okay, experience. Here's what it was. He was being hindered by Satan from coming physically again and again, right? He tried different routes, different paths, couldn't get there. So what did he do? I don't know what else to do. I'm going to write a letter to them. And that letter that he wrote was shared with the other churches and every church to this day, which we're still studying. In fact, that started the letter writing that we have most of our New Testament that God used by the Holy Spirit to encourage thousands upon thousands of believers for years and years and years to come. Do you get it? If he's looking at it in human form, I'm hindered again. I can't even get the message out. I, they think I they think I'm a jerk. They don't even know I love them. I care about them. I, what a failure. What a flop. I can't. But yet, just because he's faithful, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep. I'm going to get a message. I'm just going to. Right? He did not give up. And because of that, we're even sitting here right now being encouraged. <laughs> So don't you give up. Listen, here's a couple more real quick. And I'll take your questions. I know I keep seeing a lot of hands going up. Sorry. And here's here's a, a, another one. When what to do when your ministry is hindered. And it's don't stay discouraged. Don't stay. You know what I wrote in there originally what I wanted to write? Don't be discouraged. But you know what? Sometimes that's not realistic. I don't know, maybe you're not, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm weak, or I don't know, or maybe I'm being realistic. To me, I think I'm being realistic. Even the greatest Christians I've ever known, who love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, can get discouraged. You're not an oddball. We can all go through it, Connie. We can all go through it. You can all go through it, but don't stay discouraged. It's going to happen, but don't stay there. Don't live there. You're in good company when you're attacked or when you're hindered. Don't listen to those all those Christians and they're like, they make you think, well, you just don't have enough faith. You're just not godly enough. You're not, you know what? Sometimes, I think Paul was godly. He was loved by the Lord. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was powerful in the Word, yet he was still hindered. In fact, many times, honestly, when you're trying to give more and more to the Lord, you try to come to a Bible study, add one of those, or you start serving in the church, we would welcome it. But you know what? You're going to be hindered more. That's what I found. Stay discouraged. You're in good company. You're in good company. Joseph, Paul, Moses, Daniel, the apostles.
apostles, you are in really good company. God loves you. Don't you let that enemy lie to you that way. And then I think I have one more. I don't remember. Oh, that is right. And here's the last thing. What to do when your ministry is hindered. Remember that God is going to bring the victory. Listen, I don't know how he's going to bring that victory to you. I don't. Or when. Right? But he's going to bring it. You know something? Later on in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 5. Actually, verse 1 to 5, I should say. I just wrote it wrong. It says that he was able to go back to that area strengthen and encourage the believers like he wanted. So can Satan hinder us? Yes. Can he stop us? Yes, temporarily. But ultimately, the answer is I'll just say no. I was going to say something else, but the Lord stop me. I'll just say a very strong, emphatic no. He cannot. So you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter. I think of Spurgeon as his last thing when he said this. Suppose that we have ascertained that hindrances in our way really come from Satan. What then? I have one piece of advice, and that is, go on. Hindrance or no hindrance. In the path of duty, as God, the Holy Ghost, enables you. Listen, there were some folks, I absolutely know this from 100% truth, that needed to be sitting here listening to this sermon today. I can get, it's very easy to get very discouraged. It's usually those people who need to be here. Oh, we'll come next week and I'll be talking about something completely different that doesn't work. But whatever happened, we can still pray, God, use it. You know what? Next week, George, make some copies of the CD. Not that it's saying it's good or bad. Make some copies, would you? Make a dozen copies. <coughs> And I'm going to hand it out. If rubber wasn't here, we're just going to try again. <laughs> and I'm asking you to pray for those people. Pray for yourselves. Pray for one another. Pray for this body. Pray for this school. Pray for this church. Pray for your brothers and sisters outside here. Pray for those you're witnessing to. Because it's a spiritual battle that we're going through. And then he closes in that testimony. He says this. He says at those last verse, verse 19, for what is our hope, our joy, our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? It's you. Indeed, you are our glory. Watching you remain steadfast in the Lord. When I know you've wanted to give up, encourages my heart. Watching you, thinking to myself, what is this girl getting baptized for? She doesn't even know what she's... I, I, almost, I almost stopped you from getting baptized. God is growing you and I'm watching him grow you. And don't you let the enemy drag you down and stop you. Do not. Don't let your stumbles or your falls. You see what I'm saying? That, you don't let the enemy take you down when you're not looking. You keep your eyes open and watchful. You be sober-minded.